I'm Dr. Brad Hafford, and I study money. I've never had much of it, so I decided I'd try to figure out what it is and how it started by tracing it as far back in time as I could. I'm an archaeologist and an economic anthropologist, so the way I study money is quite different from economists and even most historians. I look at the hows and whys, mainly in the very distant past. Last time, I talked a bit about money's earliest physical manifestation, currency, and how it can clearly be shown to have existed more than 4,000 years ago. That's only part of the story of money, but it's the somewhat easier path to investigate since we can see and touch currency. Of course, proving that a particular type of object was used as currency is not as easy as it sounds. We can't really trace currency to a single origin either, though we can look for the earliest occurrence of the use of a particular object as a currency in a particular region. We've seen that silver and grain were both forms of currency in Bronze Age Mesopotamia, for example, and our evidence is pretty solid. There will always be debates on whether this equates to real money, but that's because real money is not itself well-defined. There are competing theories on when and how money developed, but I argue that the question itself is not well phrased. Since money is abstract and doesn't exist as a solely physical thing, its concept can go much farther back in time than its physical correlates. And how can we look for the origins of any abstract concept, such as faith, love, pride, or value? At its root, money is value, or rather, an attempt to quantify value. In its function as unit of account, it is numbers tracking the value of things or activities in a way that can be compared, and thus form a record of the abstract concept. These records themselves can become symbols that are sometimes traded as a kind of currency, and trading of debt like this began much earlier than most textbooks acknowledge. In fact, indebtedness is the secret to the origin of money. We need something to pay back those who have given us something or done us a service. Often that's by repaying something similar at a later date. But the idea of owing someone eventually leads to a more quantified version of that, especially as we deal with people farther and farther removed from our immediate circle of family and friends. Valuing things to a greater or lesser degree is part of being human. Through much of human history, the level of quantification of value has been extremely general, however. Examples might be, hunt with me and we'll share the catch, or let's store our grain together and we'll all survive the winter. What's happening in these examples is a very rough equation of effort and reward, a generalized value quantification. It can't be written down because there's no unit of account, but the effort we each put in should equal the amount we share in the end. No one would call this real money, but it's the core of what money eventually records and facilitates. Many people will object even with that caveat. Surely these examples are only of people cooperating and sharing, and that sort of sharing just isn't tainted by money. But even when money does not express itself, effort can be quantified and compared. We know when someone's pulling their weight, so to speak, and when they're not. Economically, quantification is always possible. Morally, maybe not. In fact, the description of what money is has typically fallen under philosophy rather than economics. Because his famous book, The Wealth of Nations, has influenced so many modern economists, we tend to think of Adam Smith only in economics. He was, however, head of moral philosophy at Glasgow University, and he considered his magnum opus to be his earlier book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Plus, quite a bit of what Smith, and later Marx, had to say about money, derived ultimately from the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. Such economic philosophers have often described money through a kind of symbolic equation. The most basic form of exchange, as they note, is a simple trade of one commodity for another. Now I realize that the word commodity is loaded, being truly applicable only for products that are mass-produced for a market, but we need a symbol here, and we'll use the letter C for commodity, 
as the philosopher economists did. Let's agree that in our interpretation, it stands for an item that a person wants to trade. The object this person gets in exchange we'll label C prime. So the exchange equation from this person's perspective would look like this. We tend to call it a barter exchange, one thing directly for another. But it leads me to one of my pet peeves about the way the history of money is frequently taught. Most economic books claim a kind of primacy of barter exchange, and that people before the civilized didn't understand that such barter was inefficient. Countless books come up with an example along the lines of, I have X, but I want Y. I must find someone who has Y, but wants X. This is called the double coincidence of wants. I look around for days, finding someone who has Y, but wants Z, so I can't trade. Then I find someone who wants X, but has W. Again, I can't trade. Sounds like one of those late-night infomercials showing all the epic fails. Has this ever happened to you? Don't you hate it when you have X and can't find Y? Why not try money, the new invention that's sweeping the nation? Call now. Operators are standing by. The history of money textbooks suggests that after thousands of years, some bright person finally invented money, allowing for a store of value. Then I could trade C for M. And I could hold M for use later to get C prime. M here is just another commodity that holds its value. It's one that most or all people will accept in exchange. It is currency, a stand-in for money, and it may have first appeared in this way, but in many different places and at many different times. Money itself, however, was not invented like this. It had been lurking there all along. The M in parentheses is exchange value, a quantification of C in terms of C prime that expresses their equivalence. When the commodities are exchanged one for the other, they set a kind of precedent. And the more often they're exchanged, the more they reach a kind of localized price, all without real money. But there's another problem. What if x is not divisible and y is small? I have to obtain huge numbers of y in order to make a trade. And apparently, I have no other recourse. At least, that's what the money history books would have us believe. Most of them come up with some version of this farcical example. I have a sheep, but I want onions. I finally found someone who has onions and wants a sheep, but how many onions equal a sheep? I don't need thousands, but I can't trade just a part of my sheep. So the only way is for me to take so many onions that they eventually spoil at my house, or to trade my sheep for only a few onions and thus lose out in the bargain, right? It's a ridiculous oversimplification of an imagined process where somebody just doesn't know their onions. Barter in this way, unthinking actors fumbling around in a heavily flawed trading system unable to make most exchanges. It's just, it's never existed. No one would fail to recognize the problem of double coincidence of wants, and certainly not for thousands upon thousands of years when this primitive barter was supposed to have reigned supreme. And no one would refuse an exchange simply because they couldn't divide their sheep, or because there weren't enough onions to cover the perceived value of the sheep. Instead, they would come to an agreement. Probably, one person would take the sheep and provide onions over time to the other person, until the value equivalence was reached. In a small group, this is easily regulated, because there's nowhere to hide. In a small society, everyone knows everyone, and debts like this are common. Indeed, this is the real origin of money, in credit and debt, in agreements between people far, far back in the undocumented past. In small communities, a monetary unit wasn't necessary. Everyone understood the kinds of commodities they had in the group and what they needed to do to obtain them. Knowing how much effort went into raising a sheep and how much went into growing onions helped them to understand value. And the closer we are to each other, the softer we are on requirements in trade anyway, such as how long we have to pay back a debt or even if we have to pay it back at all. 
Of course, people might argue for more or less of one of the commodities in an exchange, and this is another meaning of the word barter, to haggle. This sort of bartering occurs even in monetary exchanges, where each side attempts to obtain more value in the trade. But what is value? Marx, Smith, and many others all the way back to Aristotle have struggled to define it. They tended to settle on the idea of two kinds of value, use and exchange. Every object typically has a use. If I make a pair of shoes and I wear them, then they have and exhibit only their use value. But if I make a bunch of shoes to trade them with others, then I'm using them for their exchange value. Marx and many economist philosophers connected exchange value in an object with the labor that was required to make it. Labor is difficult to measure, though. It depends both on amount, time, and quality, skill, invested. If someone spends 10 hours making something but doesn't know what they're doing and makes a lot of mistakes, their labor is worth less than someone who does the task quickly and well. So to measure all labor in hours doesn't quite work. Furthermore, the quality of the materials that go into a commodity make a difference as well. Regardless, if a particular type of object, like cowrie shells, comes to represent labor, or whatever it is that makes up the abstract exchange value, then it has become currency and the parentheses fade from our equation. Now I can trade C for cowrie shells, perhaps haggling over the number of shells, and then use some or all of those shells later to obtain C prime, whether that's an onion, a sheep, or a pair of shoes. By removing the parentheses from our equation, we are making the equivalence ratio of commodities more explicit. The M becomes a physical representation of exchange value, and so long as everyone in our network agrees that M is the object that represents it, then M can circulate in exchange for any good or service. So this analysis favors the market theory of the origin of money, or of currency, really, that it grew out of a need to facilitate exchange, but we have to analyze the word market and the other theories of the origin of money. But that will have to wait until next time. Yet no matter how money or currency or coin originated, before currency, people did not blindly wander around looking for someone to give them an exact number of onions for their sheep. Some of the earliest documents in history record exchanges and distributions. They show that writing developed at least partly to record debts. And the concept of indebtedness had been around long before it was written down. People remembered who owed them and how much they were owed. Not necessarily in terms of currency, but currency came to make it easier to settle debts. Of course, haggling, and even a form of barter, continues to this day. I'm Dr. Brad Hafford. Join me again for another Money Lecture. And be sure to check out Note Nook, my series on modern paper currency.